You remember the tsunami that struck Indonesia and Southeast Asia? It was December 26, 2004. We all saw the pictures. We saw the satellite videos. We heard the stories of survivors and the people who held on to trees and houses and, and each other. And then we took up an offering, sent in our money, and then we all had to get back to work. And even to bring it up today, it just seems so distant and so far away. And the event will be forgotten by us, and the pictures will be forgotten by us. But the event of the tsunami raised a question that will never be forgotten by us, because it's a question that comes back to us again and again and again and again and again. And it will throughout our lifetime. Now, you already asked the question even before the tsunami hit. It's a question you will ask again. Not because of a tsunami on the other side of the world, but because of a tsunami in your life. And the question is, what was God thinking? I mean, hello, why would you allow that? Why did you not stop it? Are you there? Do you care? And the deeper question, which is really perplexing, if there is a God, is the problem, God, that you're loving but not all-powerful? Or maybe you're all-powerful but you're not loving? Can you be trusted? I mean, the prayers I pray at night, are they really relevant? I mean, can I really say, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep? If I should die before I wake? In a tsunami, flood, or earthquake? When we pray those prayers, are we just kind of pretending? Or are we just playing games? How about this? I hear this a lot. Is this really helpful? Did he cause it or did he allow it? Oh, he didn't cause it. He just allowed it. Oh, that's really helpful to me. I can be really comforted now to know that he didn't cause it. He just allowed it. He could have stopped it, but he didn't. He just allowed it. But the significance of that tsunami so many years ago caused, caused everybody of every religious faith to ask these questions. In fact, the Christian century put together a bunch of quotes from several different resources of people's response to the tsunami. It said, the question was posed in the starkest of forms in the Indian Ocean tsunami. Believers from all faiths, united in their duty to help victims, also corporately wondered, where was God in this unimaginable suffering? In other words, this isn't something that just perplexes Christians who have a good God. Every religion that says their God is good somehow found themselves asking the same question. The article went on. It said, skeptics argue, if God is all-powerful, isn't he all-loving? Or if he's all-loving, then he can't be all-powerful. Here's another one. Skepticism surged in many tsunami commentaries. Even the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, said, this has made me question God's existence. The article said, unlike Williams, some adherents of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam provided cocksure explanations that the tsunami was divine punishment. Some very serious liberal scholars said the problem is God cares and God is just as heartbroken as we are. God just couldn't stop it because He's not omnipotent. He's not completely in control. A radical Saudi cleric, Mohammed, and I can't even pronounce the rest of his name, claimed the waters rose to strike non-Muslim vacationers who used to sprawl all over the beaches and pubs overflowing with wine during Christmas break. And yet most of the victims were from Indonesia, the most populous Muslim-majority nation on earth. A Roman Catholic priest cast the blame wider. Here's what he wrote. He said, this is a punishment from God because everybody is leading a wretched life. That basically everybody is so bad, the world has gotten so bad that God said, you know, to heck with it, 
let's just do something tumultuous. It was a message from God to say, look, I'm the boss. And then one poor, devastated fisherman in a village that was almost completely wiped off the face of the earth said this, the mother has butchered her own children. Either there is no God or God must be cruel to do this. How do you respond? Not just to the tsunami, but to the tornado that roars through a middle-class neighborhood somewhere nearby. When your friend or your neighbor or your mother or your father calls and says something's happened and there's no explanation, somebody's not coming home, how do you respond? A couple of years ago, there was an earthquake in Iran that killed almost 30,000 people. It was hardly even reported here. 30,000 people died in an earthquake. What's your God up to? You see, this is an important issue because this is a question that will come up in your life someday. And it may be more personal the next time. It won't be devastation on the other side of the earth. It won't be pictures on the internet or on your TV screen. But one day there will be something in my life and something in your life that causes me to ask similar questions, but it will be far more personal. And I'll be scrambling for answers. And I may come up with some of the same conclusions that these people did. What in the world was God up to? Was God punishing me? Was God punishing the people around me and I just happened to be in the way? Was God punishing someone else and I just got too close? What's going on? Is there any way to believe in a great, good God and then look at current reality and somehow try to blend these two and come up with an answer that makes sense. And I think if there's any good news in all of this, it's simply this, that every time an incident like this happens, it forces us to ask the questions that I've alluded to, but hopefully to ask the preeminent question, the question that everybody needs to ask at some point in his or her life. I think it's the most important question that anybody could ask. Not where is God, not how could God, but who is God? Who is this God? Who are we dealing with here? What is he or, or she or it really like? I mean, I know what I learned in Sunday school when I was a kid. I knew what I heard in church. I, I know what I was told to memorize when I was young. But when I take that vision and that version of God and I lay it over the events, the current realities that I'm faced with, the events that, that are taking place in this world, they don't sync up. They don't match. And so I have a choice to make. Either I can pretend that there was no tsunami, there was no automobile accident. I can pretend that there was no tornado. I can pretend there was no loss of life and maintain my vision and my faith in this God that I've kind of created or someone told me existed. Or, or, I can come to the more disturbing but realistic conclusion that perhaps the God I prayed to and trusted in doesn't exist the way I thought he did. That maybe that's not really who God is at all. Because you see, when current reality conflicts with your view of God, you would be wise not to ignore current reality. And instead to ask the tough question, but the helpful question. Who then is God, really? If he's not the God that makes sure all the little children get home safely, then who is this God? If he's not the God that answers every prayer that says, protect me, guide me, direct me every single time, then who is this God? If he's not the God that will stop the devastation that we see from taking place, then who are we dealing with? Because when your view of God doesn't match up with reality, perhaps you are trusting in a God that doesn't even exist. Just a version of God. So who is this God that we worship? Who are we dealing with here? 
And is there a clue in the devastation? Is there a clue in the destruction? And is there a clue in the loss of life? And as unsettling as this is, isn't this a question that we need to ask? And aren't those clues something that we need to track down? Now here, here's the amazing thing. See, if you're a Christian, the events and consequences of tornadoes, earthquakes, and floods should not take the legs out from underneath your faith. In fact, we don't even have to flinch. In fact, as we're going to see, events like these actually substantiate what we've been saying all along. Because those of us who are Christian sometimes lose sight of what we believe. And when things like this happen, we flinch and we get a little bit insecure since we're not sure how really to answer that question. Now, we should be the most heartbroken. We should be the most generous in terms of coming back around and supporting those who have been injured by that kind of event. But at the same time, we don't need to flinch and we don't need to hide. And we don't need to go looking for ridiculous answers to questions like where was God and, and what was God doing? Because as Christians, as Christians, we know from the Old Testament from day one all the way through the New Testament that God consistently, I mean, you may not like the answer, but this is, here's the Christian response. That throughout the Old and New Testament, God has consistently used nature and consistently used weather. Whether it's famine or flood or wind or rain or lack of rain or, or pestilence or, or rivers overflowing or, or storms or lightning, you name it. That God has used all kinds of weather throughout the Old and New Testament to get people to ask the very question that I'm challenging us to ask today. To get people to stop in their tracks and say, whoa, 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 who is this? God that we're dealing with. Because throughout the Old Testament, God would use nature to get the prophets of false gods, to get the prophets of Baal and other false gods to say, if my God can't make it rain and your God made it rain, then who, who, who is your God? Why is it my God can't change the weather? Why is it my God can't stop the storm? Why is my God not able to send fire from heaven? And who is this God that suddenly out of nowhere interrupts the laws of nature, ignores our prayers, ignores our pagan idols, and acts independently on his own? Whether it's Pharaoh who thought he was a God, who thought he commanded and had leverage with the sun and the moon and the stars, had plague after plague after plague in that incredible Old Testament story. And God said to Pharaoh, you're not God. You're not God. Your pagan idols are not God. They're not God. And by the end of the story, we find Pharaoh saying to Moses, who is your God? And Moses, you take your people and get out of here and take your God with you, whoever he is. Because he is the one true living God. And Pharaoh had to admit, I've been wrong all my life about who I thought God was. Or that incredible moment of the cross. Jesus had just been crucified. Overseeing the event there that day was a Roman centurion. And the Bible said that right after Jesus died, there was an earthquake that shook the place. It opened up tombs. It opened up the earth, scared everybody to death. The sun went away and the clouds came. God took all of that energy and it impacted nature. And when this violent storm had subsided, the very centurion who oversaw the crucifixion of Christ stood there or knelt there at the cross and looked up and he said, truly, truly, this was the Son of God. And in that moment, he recognized who he was dealing with. This is God's way. We're not comfortable with it. We don't like it. But he has been consistent from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament to say in the midst of nature, taking its toll upon humanity, in those moments, we need to look up and ask the question, who are we dealing with? Really? 
And the interesting thing is, the answer to that is found in the very first book of the Bible. And if you're not a Christian, this is, this is huge. But in the very beginning, in this ancient story, we find the insights needed to piece together the reasons behind things that happen in nature that we don't understand. And in the midst of that story, once again, God is explaining who we're dealing with. We're going to go back and look at a few verses from the book of Genesis, the ones that Jess read earlier in our worship. It's the easiest book to find right after the table of contents. You just keep going, you'll get to Genesis. But I'm going to read just a few verses from Genesis chapter 1. And I really want you to say one word with me when we get to it. You'll know what it is when we get there. Okay, Genesis chapter 1. And here's what we discover, what God is like. Because when God, this is when God created the earth. And God had the earth in the beginning just the way he wanted it. And here's what we discover. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was, what? Good. And he separated the light from the darkness. Then verse 9. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let the dry ground appear. I'm glad he did that. And it was so. And God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. It was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. It was good. So God created the great creatures of the sea, every living and moving thing with which the waters teemed according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was, it was good. And then God made the wild animals according to their kinds and livestock according to their kind, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. And then you know what he did? He took some dust and he formed man and woman. And he said, I'm going to make man in my image. And in his own image, he created them, male and female, the Bible says. And he breathed the breath of life into them. And apparently, he gave us a soul. And the chapter ends with this. This is verse 31. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Now, when God created this earth, and he had it just the way he wanted it, it was just the way that we want it to be now. When God created the heavens and the earth, and he had it just the way he wanted it, it was exactly the way we know it ought to be now. Which leads us to one of the other most important questions you can ever ask if you want to understand who God is. And that's this question. What in the world happened? I mean, how is it that evil crept into this world? How is it that nature doesn't cooperate? How is it that people don't do what they're supposed to do? Where did evil come from? How is it your children don't have to be taught to do something wrong? Your children never have to be taught to lie. Where did evil come from? For things are not as God originally created them. Why don't people just behave? Why don't your children just do what you tell them to do? Why can't countries get along? Why can't Democrats and Republicans get along? What is that? What is that thing in us? Where did it come from? And here's the deeper question, more perplexing. How is it that we know that things aren't as they should be? Where did we get this knowledge of here's what is good and here's what is not good? How do we know that this ought to be and this ought not to be? 
Where did that knowledge come from? This is huge. But there's a little verse in the Bible, and I bet you've read it a dozen times and just went right by it because it seems so insignificant. But here's what so is, is so incredibly brilliant about the Bible, I think. Here's, this is why I believe this is the explanation. And though I'd be the first to admit that this message today is not emotionally satisfying, I'll admit that. Because at the end of the message, we're not all going to go, well, I feel a lot better after he preached that. It's not emotionally satisfying. But the reason that these events don't take the legs out from under our faith if you're a Christian is because so much of the Scripture explains and gives context for this. And here's what the Bible says. This is amazing. When God put Adam and Eve in the garden, God said, and this is great, God said, everything's good. And then he said, now, I've only got one rule. Now, this is a clue, by the way, about God. When God had everything just the way he wanted it, guess how many rules he had? Just one. You see, I like God. God and I get along great because I don't like rules either. Apparently, God didn't like rules. Imagine that. But when God had the world just the way he wanted it, he only had one rule. And the rule was, don't eat of the fruit of that tree. And Adam and Eve said, what tree? And then they said, why? And God told them why. Listen to the reason for this. Are you ready for this? God said, and this is in the Bible, on the day that you eat of that tree, you will gain something that you will wish you never gained. Are you ready for this? It's in the Bible. Because you'll gain the knowledge of good and evil. On the day that you eat the fruit of that tree, you will have something that will drive you crazy the rest of your life. You will have the knowledge of good and evil. You know what that means? That's why we're so aware of how things could be and why it drives us crazy that things aren't ever that way. It's the knowledge of good and evil. I know that people shouldn't mistreat children, but they mistreat children anyway. If I didn't know that they shouldn't, then it wouldn't bother me that they do. But I live with the knowledge, and you live with the knowledge of good and evil. Isn't that amazing? The Bible answers that question. And in answering that question, The Bible gives us another clue as to who we're dealing with. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, God not only gave them the knowledge of good and evil, but he did what any great and good God would do. He judged sin. And we're very quick to be judgmental of God, and we say, God, you overjudge. God, you overreact. But to do anything less would show him not to be a good and a great God. see, the thing we don't like and the mystery that's revealed, the thing that doesn't sit well with you and me is that when nature wreaks havoc on humanity, it is evidence that God is great and that God is good because He is the God who would not and could not turn a blind eye to sin. Do you know what the moral of the story is? God is great, and God is good, if only we had been. This is why every night of my life, in some form, when everyone is home safe, and we get to eat dinner together, and Tyra is there, and I'm there, and we get Joshua tucked in and say his prayers, have everything we need, and everybody's safe, I can pray, Heavenly Father, thank you for one more day of allowing me to be the exception to the rule. Because you are such a good God, and you are a great God. And today, oh God, you've reminded me again that you are a gracious God because you're giving me exactly what I don't deserve. And you say, well, Bruce, I'm real happy for you, buddy. I really am. But you didn't answer the question. 
And the reason it's not the full answer is because it's only half the story. That's why there are two parts in the conclusion of this series. It's a little bit like going to the doctor. The doctor says, I've got some really bad news. I've diagnosed your problem, and you have a life-threatening disease. The good news is I'm telling you the truth. But your next question for him is the same question that you have for God in response to a message like this. So you found out my problem and you told me the truth. My question is, can you and will you do something about it? And you see, that all depends on just how good and how great and how gracious God is. And that's where we pick up the story next Sunday as we conclude this series. Ever wonder why? I hope you'll be here. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we have all felt the sting of sin. And we live in a day and age where we see it sadly every day. Even when it's not connected to us directly. And Father, I pray that it would be a wake-up call for many of us to keep asking the most important question that we can ask. Not where are you, but, but who are you? Who are you, God? And that, Father, we would discover in our own experience that you are the good and that you are the great and that you are the gracious God who still holds the whole world in his hands. Too good and too great to ignore sin and yet too good and too great to cast us aside. And I pray, O oh God, that we would be men and women who would spend all of our lives celebrating your goodness and your greatness and your grace. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Always helps to turn the mic on. Uh,